Good afternoon, colleagues and friends. My name is James Kingston. I'm the legal advisor at the Department of Foreign Affairs and your host uh, this afternoon. Uh, Madam Prosecutor, Adina Ushal, Faltero at the Rasha Rishko Dublin. That's a few words of welcome in our native language. You're very welcome here. Uh, respected person back to Dublin. Uh, it's your third visit, I think, to Ireland. We were very happy to, ha uh, to host you here before, and we hope to host you in person again. But in the difficult times in which we find ourselves, we are communicating via remote means. Um, colleagues, I am pleased to welcome you all to this uh, Institute of International and European Affairs. Uh, event, which is part of the Global Europe uh, project, supported by my own colleagues uh, the, in the Department of Foreign Affairs and the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Simon Coveney. Uh, this project aims to address, analyze, and communicate to a wider public the debate on the European Union's role in the world and Ireland's role in the multilateral order, with a particular focus on Ireland's uh, term as a non-permanent member of the United Nations Security Council, uh, this year and next. And as you may know, one of the three themes that is informing our membership of the Council is accountability, which is, of course, particularly pertinent to, to our discussion this afternoon. So we're delighted to be joined here today by the Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, Mrs. Fatou Bansouda, who has been generous enough to take time out of her very, very busy schedule uh, to speak to us this afternoon. As I say, this is her third visit to Ireland, um, and uh, she luckily has not had to confine herself to, to Dublin. She has been lucky enough to visit the Irish Human Rights Centre in Galway. We had a very nice trip there and very good uh, seafood. Um, our friends in, in Galway, uh, uh, as ever, generously host us as part of their annual ICC summer school. So we're very pleased uh, to be joined by Mrs. Bansuda today. She's going to speak for approximately 25 to 30 minutes and then we'll go to questions and answers with, with the audience. You'll be able to join the discussion using the question and answer function on Zoom, which you should see on your screen. And please feel free to send in your questions throughout the session as they occur to you, and we'll come to them once the prosecutor has finished her presentation. And we're going to operate, you know, uh, a, a sort of managed democracy if we were. So if a particular number of questions come up repeatedly, we should give them a certain amount of priority. Um, and I'd like to also welcome those who are watching us today on YouTube. So just to remind you that today's presentation and the questions and answers are both on the record, usually, of course, in the House. Uh, the presentation is on the record, but the Q&A are subject to the Chatham House rule. And also, you should feel free to, to join in the discussion on Twitter using the handle hashtag IIEA. So I'm now going to formally introduce Mrs. Bensuda and hand over to her. So Mrs. Fatou Bensouda is the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, having assumed office in 2012. She was elected in 2011 by consensus by the Assembly of States Parties to serve in this capacity. Mrs. Bensouda was nominated and supported as the sole African and the sole candidate for the post by the African Union and African States Parties. And she's the first woman, but hopefully not the last woman to serve as ICC prosecutor. Between 1987 and uh, 200, Mrs. Bensuda was Senior State Counsel, Principal State Counsel, Deputy DPP, Solicitor General, Attorney General and Minister for Justice uh, in the Republic of Gambia, her native uh, country, Chief Legal Advisor to the President and, and Cabinet. And she left, uh, you know, for reasons I think of principle and worked in um, private practice and then took up a career as a, a, a civil servant, an international civil servant at the ICTR, um, and subsequently joined the ICC as the first deputy prosecutor, um, which is, I think, when I first met you in The Hague in that capacity, uh, Madam Prosecutor accompanying President Mary McAleese on a visit to the court. Um, so, Mrs. Bensuda, I think it's fair to say, has had an extremely difficult job for the past nine years. Um, and we really salute your courage, we in Ireland, and, and I know me personally, salute your courage, because not only were you dealing with an extremely heavy workload, you were dealing with criticism, both justified and unjustified. The most acute criticism came when you were actually doing your job. And the reason for this, of course, is that 
accountability, funnily enough, is not popular with people who commit genocide, war crimes and crimes against humanity. I know, like everybody else, you were also dealing with, with difficult personal circumstances, being separated from your family, and also, as I say, uh, constant attacks on, on your reputation, both professionally and personally. You were singled out uh, together with a senior member of your staff uh, by uh, the United States government under the previous uh, regime. Uh, you were subjected to personal sanctions and humiliating restrictions on your visa. And worse than that, in some ways, so were some members of your staff. And it's always difficult as, 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 as a manager to send your staff out into the front line. But nonetheless, you, you cope with great grace and courage. And I think your work has been recognized because you're the recipient of numerous awards, including by the International Commission of Justice, uh, the World Peace Through Law Award, uh, the American Society of International Law's Honorary Membership Award, and the Peace Prize by the United Nations Association of Spain. Numerous honorary doctorates, uh, one of the, the top 100 most influential people in the world, one of the most influential Africans, leading global thinker, one of the top 50 African women in the world, according to Jeune Afrique. Uh, and, you know, uh, you in 2018 have joined the eminent roster of international gender champions. And I would like to, perhaps it feeds into your, your talk, to see if you think that you're, you're, the fact that you ha are a woman has been used against you uh, in attacks uh, when you're performing your functions. But look, there, there are so many things I could say about you and to you, but um, enough of me. And I would now like to hand over to you, Mrs. Bensuda, for, as I say, approximately 25 to 30 minutes following which we will have questions and answers from a very eager audience. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kinsland. Thank you for that, those kind words, that uh, those introductory remarks. And uh, distinguished guests, uh, your excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to deliver this keynote speech for the prestigious Institute of International and European Affairs and to make this modest contribution to the Global Europe Project. At the outset, I would like to also extend my profound gratitude to Mr. Collins and to Jill Donohue, along with the, with the colleagues at the Institute for inviting me to present this lecture. I'm really honored and grateful for the opportunity. And I equally wish to extend my thanks to you, Mr. Kinston, uh, the legal advisor at the Department of Foreign Affairs of Ireland for, the, for your introduction, astute introduction and uh, outlining Ireland's important contribution to the promotion of the rule of law and to the International Criminal Court and indeed for moderating today's exchange. Ireland has been a strong supporter of the ICC since its inception. Having had the pleasure of traveling to Ireland twice, uh, you mentioned that Mr. Kinston, during my term as ICC prosecutor, I really would have rejoiced the prospect of a third visit physically to once again enjoy your country's rich traditions and culture and to be with you in person for the equally rich exchanges I have come to expect in my interaction with Irish officials. But alas, it must be on another occasion in a, in a future capacity as uh, the unfortunate COVID-19 pandemic continues to present obstacles. And personally, I'm concluding my mandate as prosecutor this summer. But it is a privilege nevertheless to share with you today through this virtual setting, a few thoughts on the importance of accountability and the rule of law. The role of the ICC within this context, the current state of play, along with reflections on my office's achievements, but also the challenges encountered during my term in the office, as well as future opportunities. To, to accurately frame these considerations, let us recall firstly that the ICC was built on the lessons of history of unspeakable atrocities that for centuries have reigned unchecked, leaving victims without recourse to justice. And its origins lies in the unprecedented efforts of the Nuremberg and Tokyo military tribunals where for the first time, individuals irrespective of, of rank or status stood trial and were convicted for their roles in the egregious 
and systematic crimes committed during the Second World War in particular. The atrocities witnessed during that war, including the horrors of the Holocaust, shocked humanity's conscience to make progress towards the creation of a permanent international criminal court with the hope of never again, or at least with the aspiration of ensuring that those who commit these serious crimes, no matter how powerful, are held to account. As we know, during the bipolar Cold War and its dynamics, efforts to establish a permanent mechanism to deal with atrocity crimes essentially froze. And the world had to witness more unspeakable crimes, including those committed in the former Yugoslavia, here in Europe's own neighborhood again, and Rwanda, until it was ready to accept the need for a permanent court to try the court's most heinous, the world's most heinous and destabilizing crimes. As such, in Rome in 1998, the idea behind this aspiration was given effect with the creation of the first permanent international criminal court, complementary to national jurisdictions with jurisdiction over genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and since 2018, the crime of aggression. And the ICC was built as part of wider efforts to establish a rules-based order that aims to create a culture of accountability of atrocity crimes, contribute to their prevention, and therewith save future generations from the scourge of destructive power rivalry, perpetual conflicts, and mass atrocities. And as I deliver these remarks before you today, I observe with concern that in this new century, we find increasingly, we find ourselves confronted with threats to multilateralism and the post-World War II based, rules-based global order where the sanctity of sovereignty is misappropriated in the service of exceptionalism and a rejection of international law and the international rule of law. But lest we forget that multilateralism as the preferred modus operandi for interstate relations and cooperation, multilateral institutions, including those that advance the peaceful settlement of disputes and the rule of law, they are all hard earned fruits of our costly experience, of our common loss, and indeed our common awakening and wisdom. And in an increasingly interdependent world, faced with global challenges from climate change and cross-border terrorism to war and mass atrocities, real success and progress depends on our willingness to acknowledge that it is only through collaboration and a concerted effort that we can hope to counter the destructive and destabilizing force of these ills. And that system, as we know it, is increasingly being challenged by potent forces. The setbacks we are currently witnessing are, however, not inevitable, and there are many countercurrents. Ladies and gentlemen, in the current political context, when multilateralism is under such duress, how, how about the case of international criminal justice as represented by the International Criminal Court and the wider system established by the Rome Statute, which founded the ICC? After all, the court was established, was not established in a vacuum. And nor does it today operate in a vacuum. It is often said that if someone would have the idea to create a court in the current state of the world in disarray, they would perhaps never succeed. Perhaps, but I posit that the creation of the court must be one of humanity's proudest moments. And I say this not as a partisan, but as a person who brings her mind to what the ICC is all about. What are the values and the goals of the Rome Statute and what it means in the broader context, the broader global context. And for me, the ICC is a central pillar of a rule-based international system rooted in respect for international law and the fight against impunity for the world's gravest crimes of concern to the international community. Over 120 states across the world created the International Criminal Court as an independent judicial institution, 
complementary to national jurisdiction with the mandate to investigate and prosecute genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and the crime of aggression. With the creation of the International Criminal Court, an important normative, but also structural and system-based message was sent globally. That first, the commission of mass atrocities as merely politics by other means will no longer receive a pass. And that perpetrators, irrespective of rank or official status, must answer for their crimes. Secondly, that an international criminal justice system is crucial to a rule-based global order. And its institutional manifestation in the form of the ICC is now a reality and an important part and parcel of the global system. Today, the court benefits from the membership of 123 states parties and has possibly greater reach due to the court's jurisdictional competence. Victims and affected communities are at the center of the international criminal justice system, which was thus created. And indeed, there are many ways that the courts raise on death and have a, a crucial role in the ICC proceedings. This is exemplified also through the crucial mandate and the work of the Trust Fund for Victims, which as a separate body from the court has as main mission to implement court ordered reparations and to provide physical, psychological, and material support to the victims and their families. And we all know that Ireland is a major supporter and a contributor to the Trust Fund for Victims. Against this backdrop, with victims of atrocity crimes as its main drivers since the start of its operations in 2003, the Office of the Prosecutor has endeavored to implement its crucial mandate to investigate and prosecute Rome Statute crimes with full independence and impartiality, and in accordance with the legal provisions of the Rome Statute that guide our operations. A daunting task and responsibility for the mere fact that the court, court has uh, as potential operating theater, the territory of, uh, as, pot as potential operating theater, the territory of 123 states parties that have joined the court and beyond giving the powers of the UN Security Council to refer situations to the court, as well as the court's extraterritorial reach to also consider the conduct of nationals of states parties. Ladies and gentlemen, when I became prosecutor in 2012, the court had been functioning for nearly a decade. Under the first prosecutor, an organizational structure was created. The first situations had been selected for investigations in accordance with the prosecu prosecu prosecutorial statutory powers and through a number of early successes achieved by the office in the court, the ICC managed to establish itself as an important judicial institution in the multilateral setting. At the same time, I felt it was important to engage in critical reflection on past performance, see where we would build on what was accomplished and to enhance our operations with a view to solidifying the office and there with the court as a permanent institution with long-term perspective and goals. The changes we undertook after I assumed office were considerable. We launched a number of initiatives concerning strategic direction, organizational management, and internal office culture. And notably, we adopted a new dras drastically different prosecutorial strategy with a major shift in how we investigate and build our cases. The strategy, amongst other things, focused on in-depth investigations and being as trial ready as possible before triggering the judicial process, diversifying our evidence base with reliance, with less reliance on witnesses where possible. We also enhance our quality control mechanism, streamline and strengthen our administrative procedures, improve transparency in how we conduct our work and made significant efforts to build a positive office culture led by organizational values of dedication, integrity, and respect in all that we do. In short, 
we have sought to strengthen an office that is accountable at all levels, both in terms of performance and professional conduct with a view to continuous improvement. Our focus has been on quality rather than quantity to secure successes in court. And under my leadership, the office has achieved a number of important litigation successes and landmark decisions, such as the ruling delivered in Myanmar, Bangladesh situation, confirming the court's jurisdiction over the alleged deportation of Rohingya people, an investigation which is now open, and also the appellate ruling in the head of state immunity in the Al-Bashir case in the Darfur, Sudan situation. We have also secured important convictions that do not only contribute to delivering justice to victims of mass atrocities, but also to the development of international criminal law jurisprudence. I'll give you an example. In the Natanga case, emanating from our investigations in the Democratic Republic of Congo situation, my office secured the conviction of the accused person on all counts, including for the first time in the court's history the crime of sexual slavery, as well as the crime of rape against men and women. And through this case, we have contributed to emerging jurisprudence by extending the protection under international humanitarian law to also cover crimes committed by an armed group against members of their own armed group. The Al Mahdi case is another example. Following our investigations in the situation in Mali, the case sent a clear message that the int intentional attacks against historic monuments and buildings dedicated to religion is a serious crime under international law. And this message was widely recognized and amplified as it reverberated through a variety of international actors, including our institutional partners at UNESCO who were invested and assisted with this case. And earlier this month, my office secured the conviction of Dominic Ongwen in relation to the Uganda situation on 61 counts of war crimes and crimes against humanity, which included important conviction on the basis of sexual and gender-based crimes and crimes against children, including for the first time, the crimes of forced marriage and forced pregnancy. Through these decisions, the court sends an important message globally that perpetrators of atrocities must be and will be held accountable. Additionally, we currently have multiple cases in progress at pretrial and trial stages concerning alleged perpetrators from Darfur, Central African Republic, Mali, and Kenya. As we speak, the office is busy with ongoing preliminary examinations in multiple situations across the globe to determine in accordance with the strict legal criteria of the Rome Statute, if investigations should be initiated. And these uh, criteria take into account the court's complementary nature, meaning that it will defer to domestic proceedings where this is possible. The prelim preliminary examinations we are currently conducting include the situations in the Philippines, Colombia, Guinea, and Venezuela having just concluded our preliminary examinations with respect to situations in Nigeria, Ukraine, and Iraq slash UK. We are in parallel conducting active investigations, meaning we are collecting evidence in order to establish persons most responsible for the commission of the crimes alleged in nine situations, including in Mali, Bangladesh, Myanmar, the Central African Republic, Libya, Darfur, and Georgia. In Afghanistan, we are currently carefully assessing the documentation that have been received from the government of Afghanistan in support of its request to the office to defer to its national investigations. And that process is ongoing. With respect to the situation in Palestine, the judges of the pretrial chamber recently rendered a ruling by majority clarifying the scope of the court's territorial jurisdiction in that situation, following my office's request in that regard last year. We welcome this judicial clarity. My office is currently analyzing the decision and will then decide its next step guided strictly 
by its independent and impartial mandate and obligations under the Rome Statute. And I wish to emphasize here that my office conducts its activities consistently with utmost professionalism, independence, and impartiality, guided solely by its legal mandate as stipulated in the Rome Statute and the information and evidence that emerges from its preliminary examinations and investigation activities. And for me, this is critical to the credibility and longevity of an institution as important as the ICC, not least given the political environment in which our cases operate. There is increasing evidence based on the growing body of empirical research and criminal justice literature to believe that ICC decisions, in particular, the prospect of conviction are likely to continue to change the calculus and the behavior of would-be perpetrators. More generally, one can submit, based on studies and practice, that the ICC jurisdiction and its work and its engagement and symbiotic relationship with domestic authorities and other actors contribute to ensuring a greater awareness of and the readiness to ensure adequate accountability responses and standards for human rights protection. The impact of the court goes well beyond its actions in the courtroom or in the cases in its docket. The decisions tangibly demonstrate also the unique contribution my office can make in the fight against impunity for those crimes that we typically, that are typically underreported or insufficiently addressed at the domestic level, such as the sexual and gender-based crimes, crimes affecting or against children and crimes against cultural heritage. We have elevated the first two issues to key priorities under the office strategic plans and adopted comprehensive policy papers to highlight the importance of addressing these crimes to elaborate on the applicable legal framework, take a systematic approach to the prosecution of these crimes and to provide a reference to the extent that our work and best practices can be helpful to efforts at the national level. A third policy on the protection of cultural heritage within the Rome Statute framework is currently being finalized and will be launched prior to the end of my mandate. Ladies and gentlemen, to give full effect to the court's prosecutorial powers, its independent mandate and the Rome Statute framework, that is for the court to function effectively as intended and designed by its drafters, it needs to have the support and cooperation from its states parties and other stakeholders, including United Nations entities and regional organizations such as the European Union. My office in the exercise of its core functions, preliminary examinations, investigations and prosecutions engages with a myriad of actors, including early responders, in particular during the initial stages of engagement in a situation to ensure the preservation of evidence and domestic authorities throughout the whole process. Judicial and law enforcement authorities provide investigative and operational assistance by furnishing or granting access to information such as official data and records, judicial files, financial and banking data by facilitating access to diaspora members and to asylum and immigration records, or by facilitating access to and collection of information from private entities, such as social media or other tech companies. And I want to seize this opportunity to commend Ireland, which indeed is a frequent cooperation partner of my office and provides invaluable assistance that helps advance our investigative efforts. My office's engagement with its stakeholders is rich and diverse. Support is required not only to ensure the requisite level of assistance to our operations, but also to enhance diplomatic and political support for our work, to protect the court's integrity and independence, and to improve the general understanding of the court's mandate. We are proud of the relationships of trust and mutual respect that we have fostered during my tenure. This is important also because we are at a juncture where, as I mentioned, concepts and manifestations 
of multilateralism and the rule-based global order are increasingly challenged and at times even rejected. My office and I personally have our own share of experiences in this regard. By the nature of its work, the court operates in fragile conflict or post-conflict situations during ongoing hostilities or against the backdrop drop of ongoing peace negotiations. The court's operating environment is highly politicized and political stakes are usually high, in particular when those in power fear investigation and prosecution by the ICC. It is therefore no surprise that when the office and the court become involved in a given situation, there may be those who fear that our efforts will bring some measure of justice, who will act as a spoiler to peace efforts, or who will, who's those who deliberately accuse us of having political motivations or bias. Yes, yet we all know nothing will be further from the truth. While sensitive and alert to the circumstances in which we operate, my office conducts its activities consistently with independence and impartiality, guided solely by its legal mandate as stipulated in the Rome Statute and the information and evidence that emerges from its preliminary examination. In this regard, I wish to recall also, as others have said before, that the quest for justice and peace can and must be seen as mutually reinforcing imperatives. This thought is anchored in the text of the Rome Statute and, the, and in the institutional relation, notwithstanding their strict separate mandates between the court and the UN Security Council where Ireland currently holds a seat as a non-permanent member. The Security Council holds important tools to ensure a measure of accountability in situations under its attention including through its power to refer situations for investigations to my office. My office looks forward to enhancing synergies and opportunities with, with Ireland and the other ICC states parties currently serving on the council, building on the good work done in recent years, including through the ICC focal point on the council. I know this is also on the minds of those colleagues responsible in the Irish foreign minister and my office stands ready to work together towards those aims. Without prejudice to all aforementioned considerations, the court and my office in particular have received significant political pushback from some quarters against its independent mandate. We have been subjected to unprecedented and wholly unacceptable threats attacks and sanctions this past year for honorably serving the Rome Statute. These sanctions and coercive measures must be lifted without further delay. They have not, and they will not be successful in preventing the court from duly meeting its mandate, and have only brought reputational damage and angst for the authors of such measures. Such tactics only beget a lose-lose scenario. A reset is in order without delay, and that reset must start with the lifting of all coercive measures and a constructive engagement and respect for the Rome Statute system of international criminal justice. And while the court and its states, states parties, including Ireland, demonstrated resilience, including by publicly denouncing such measures and tactics, our shared values and commitments under the Rome Statute have been seriously tested. We should continue to withstand efforts from potent forces determined to undermine the court in order to shield themselves from the legitimate scrutiny, legal scrutiny that the statute demands as the court continues to dutifully fulfill its important mandate in situations requiring its attention. We must dispel dishonest attacks or deliberate misrepresentations of the court's work and mandate. We must continue to stand firm in our resolve and speak with one voice that the commission of mass atrocities as mere politics by other means will no longer receive a pass. And that perpetrators, irrespective of, of rank or official status must answer for their crimes. We must continue to work for the victims of atrocity crimes who look at the court as a last beacon of hope. 
What is right and the suffering and plight of victims of atrocity crimes must not be sacrificed at the altar of political expediency. Today, what is required is more justice and accountability, not less. Ladies and gentlemen, we ought to distinct uh, undue attacks from genuine efforts to improve the court's functioning. I do not wish to unintentionally create any impression that my office is not open to criticism in relation to its functioning. On the contrary, my office has and will continue to embrace well-founded critique as an opportunity for, for self-reflection and ultimately growth. And as I put it to you at the start of my lecture, the office under my direction committed to a culture of continuous learning and improvement. We recognize that setbacks can serve as a learning experience and an opportunity to make improvements where required. And this embrace of change management is reflected alone in the three consecutive strategic plans issued during my term. And in the same spirit of improvement, we have also engaged in the independent expert review, which was commissioned by the state parties as an opportunity to enhance the effectiveness of the court and the Rome Statute system in line with our own policy, our own philosophy and commitment to take the office and the effective discharge of our mandate to the next level. We're looking to the report of the independent experts, uh, external experts that was issued last September for inspiration and fact-based actionable recommendation, which we can then carry forward with this overall objective in mind. And a full response of the court to the report is currently being prepared and will be submitted to state parties before the end of March. But by the same token, the commitments and contributions of the court state parties in operational, political, and financial terms should be part and parcel of this review ex exercise. If changes are to be made that can truly strengthen the court and its laudable goals to ensure its success for the next generation. I have been on record in recent years to express my honest concern over the incompatibility of the court's mandate with the resources allocated to it. And this is a real tension between the court's foundational goals and the demands that have been placed upon the institution on the one hand and the capacity of the court, in particular, that of my office on the other. This dilemma cannot be resolved merely by demanding greater prioritization by the office. It requires a strategic discussion among state parties and other stakeholders. I only have a few more months left to serve as prosecutor of the ICC. And during my term, I have done everything in my power to honor the trust and the responsibility bestowed upon me by the state parties by implementing the crucial prosecutorial mandate to the best of my ability and always in accordance with the legal confines of the Rome Statute with integrity, independence and impartiality and the plight of victims and affected communities in mind. And I will continue to do so until my, my term runs out in June. Following last week's election of the next prosecutor, I intend to engage in discussions with my successor, Mr. Karim Khan, to ensure that he is in the best possible position to carry forward the important work and the mandate of the office in the service of the Rome Statute. Mr. Khan brings with him a wealth of experience and acumen to lead the office and we welcome him to the post where, when he assumes office in June of this year. I have already held productive preliminary discussions with Mr. Khan, which I intend to continue with regular interactions and exchanges as we move towards the end of my mandate. My office stands ready to fully support this transition. I trust that state parties will afford Mr. Khan strong cooperation and support as I have benefited from through my term, throughout my term. I understand my learned colleague, Fergal Geno, is also in the audience today. And I also wish to seize the occasion here to congratulate him on his appointment as an international judge at the Kosovo Specialist uh, Chambers and for how close he came to in the process of electing the next ICC prosecutor to extend to him my admiration and to wish him the very best. 
it is good to virtually see you, Fergo. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to close. To close by stating that we must do all we can to ensure that security, stability, and the protective embrace of the law becomes a reality to be relished by all in all corners of the world. Ultimately, international criminal justice with the ICC at its core serves humanity as a whole. I believe this message is well understood in Ireland as your constitution affirms in Article 29, the country's devotion to the ideal of peace and friendly cooperation amongst nations founded on international justice and morality. Let us carry forward our work with this devotion in the hope that it can be replicated for the sake of victims of atrocity crimes the world over and for the sake of our future generations. The ICC is here to say, it deserves our unflinching support, not for its own sake, but for the sake of humanity. I will, I will repeat that. The ICC is here to stay. It de deserves our unflinching support, not for its own sake, but for the sake of humanity. So I thank you all for your attention and I look forward to our exchange in the question and answer session. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, uh, Mrs. Bensuda. If we were in a room with you, we would be standing up and applauding you. Uh, as you say, the court is here to stay. Your legacy remains, even as you yourself move on in the coming months. Um, you mentioned, of course, we have a very distinguished audience, including, as you mentioned, Judge Gaynor, who, who from the Kosovo Specialist Chambers and also from the, uh, as a prosecutor in the, in the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia. And Fergal, as you know, we're very, very proud of you. Um, and uh, we also, of course, um, wish the very greatest of success to uh, Karim Khan QC, who will hopefully be able to steer the court along the, and the office of the prosecutor along the course that you have uh, indicated. Um, and, uh, you know, we hope that he, like you, Madam Prosecutor, will represent the values of independence, impartiality, and above all, integrity, because you have that uh, in spades, as we say. Um, so there are, as you can imagine, a plethora of questions from a very eager audience, but we can't go through all of them. I suppose I'm going to ask I would normally, if we were live, ask people to, <clears throat> you know, take two or two, three questions at a time. I don't think we necessarily need to do that here, but let me just start. Um, first of all, I'm going to just abuse my privilege as chair um, and ask you, you've come almost to the end of your mandate. Can you tell us uh, the uh, thing of which you're most proud uh, during your nine years as prosecutor? And could you also tell us your biggest regret uh, during your nine years as prosecutor? Thank you, uh, Mrs. Bensuda. Thank, thank, thank you for that. Thank you for that uh, um, uh, question. Um, as I said in my lecture, uh, this is uh, um, a term that I have seen as a, as a privilege, as to have had the privilege to, to serve in this uh, position. And uh, from the very beginning, I, uh, I, I think I have uh, uh, decided to give it my very best, uh, my very, very best. I've mentioned this uh, several times in full independence and impartiality and respect for the position that, was, uh, um, that I was elected to. Um, and I'll just start, I, I mean, it's, it's a lot to say uh, that I feel it's uh, my uh, greatest achievement as, uh, as my term, but I'll just try to summarize it. And uh, we'll say that uh, um, the first thing that I did upon taking, taking office uh, was uh, to, to, to bring along and uh, very, very carefully explain to my um, senior staff that we needed to invest significant efforts to office building, first and foremost. And uh, I believe this is uh, part of my greatest contribution. 
uh, and I and I think I, I I believe it will be agreed that it has uh, brought important dividends to the office and to the ICC as a as a whole. Um, because after I carefully, uh, I had a careful analysis of past successes and failures uh, during my term. I and having had the benefit of being the deputy prosecutor before assuming the position of uh, uh, prosecutor, um, I decided together with my team that we will promulgate some sweeping changes across the office, which will concern uh, strategic direction, organizational management, internal office culture. I thought that was important. And adopted in the process some, some uh, new prosecutorial strategy, which, uh, as I said in my lecture, uh, gave us a major shift in how we investigate and build our cases. Uh, we also tried to enhance our quality control mechanism. We tried to streamline and strengthen our administrative procedures. We, I, I, I said it was important to improve transparency in how we conduct our work and also made significant efforts to build a positive office culture, including, as I said, uh, the code of conduct for my office from the very beginning, the core values, you can see it uh, at my back. This is what my, my office has been guided by throughout uh, my term in office. All, all staff, in, we, we, we were all trained starting from myself to uh, deputy prosecutor, senior staff, everybody was trained in these uh, core values of the office and also to have, uh, to, be to be guided strictly by the code of conduct of the office. Uh, this is, this is, these are things I thought I could, I could also do. There is also the, um, poli the, the, the comprehensive policy papers that I was able to, uh, to launch, to bring out such as those relating to sexual and gender-based crimes, crimes against children, and also to elaborate on uh, applicable legal framework and, and, and take a, a systematic approach uh, to, to prosecutions. So uh, like, the, like the case selection and prioritization policy, which is which, are, which was also taken out. And as I said, I'm, I'm still working on, it's almost done, working on the uh, policy on cultural heritage. So, and then what we did was throughout my term, we, keep, we kept these policies under review and also assess how we apply them. Um, and as an office that is committed to a, a culture of continuous learning and improvement, uh, then we also recognize that uh, setbacks can serve as a learning experience and also as an opportunity to make improvement where we required. So um, this is, this is uh, not to mention some of the cases that, uh, as you know, I said it in my, in my lecture, some of the cases and the important um, innovations that have been made and contributions that have been made to international criminal law and international criminal jurisprudence. I, I, I don't want to repeat them here, but those are things that have uh, happened. I was also able to uh, work very closely with external partners including including states parties, for instance, on the continent, on the African continent, you do know that there was a time when it was really very, very tough for, for, for the court and the office and there were threats of withdrawal. I worked very hard on this uh, with uh, African leaders and also partners on the African continent to bring about more understanding of what this court is all about. It is not about targeting Africa. It is not go about going after African states of hate, state, heads of state. And I think this uh, served in the long run together with other efforts that have been made from my office, but also across the court and uh, other partners, uh, other states parties. And I, I, I think we have been able to see success and achievement in that regard uh, to the extent that we have been able to improve on our relationship with Africa as a, as a, as a continent and also to be able to do our work. So even, even after all the, threat, the threats of withdrawal, you were able to see that uh, we had referrals from the African continent. And, and here I had in mind uh, the referral from um, uh, not only uh, Cote d'Ivoire, but also from uh, uh, Central African Republic, and also uh, um, uh, um, <clears throat> and also uh, the, the the fact that we were able to 
engage uh, with the new government of uh, Sudan. Um, even after all the problems that we have had, we've been able to engage and we are hoping that this engagement will go forward. So in a nutshell, uh, this is, uh, I'm summarizing here, in a nutshell, this is what we have been focused on. And I think these are achievements for the, uh, um, not only the credibility of the institution, but also for the longevity of the, of the constitution. Um, uh, sorry, of the, of, the, of the Rome Statute and the court. Um, I, I, I think the Rome Statute has very, very laudable goals and everything that can be done in the service of those laudable goals is what was uh, driving myself and my office. Well, thank you. Thank you again, uh, Mrs. Bantuda. There are so many questions, so little time, but I'll try and just give a selection because uh, uh, we'll see how many you can answer and apologies to those I, I can't bring into the discussion. But again, look at, I think what you've said um, throughout this time we've spent together is very resonant for an Irish audience. You know, we have a long history of war and famine uh, and uh, we are particularly committed for that reason to protection of victims and to, to bringing uh, 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 to account uh, perpetrators of, of mass violations of, of human rights. Um, so there have been, as I say, many, many questions. I'll give the first word to, to Judge Fergal Gaynor, who, who just wants to express his thanks to you today for uh, your talk and to you for your, your, your nine years of hard work at the helm of, of OTP. Sure. Um, we're also, as, as you can expect, there are in, in such an audience, um, an Irish audience is particularly interested in the question of Palestine. And we're lucky enough to have with us today the ambassador of Palestine to Ireland, His Excellency, uh, Dr. Jalan Wahaba Abidjad. And I, on his behalf, I would just like to uh, welcome you again uh, today. Um, and uh, the ambassador recalls meeting you in Dublin in 2013 and, uh, and encountering you again over the years. Uh -huh. uh, and then he refers, of course, to the difficult and, may I say, incredibly um, uh, a decision that was worthy of respect in relation to the situation in Palestine. You referred that question to the pre-trial chamber of the ICC, which seems to certainly me, speaking in my individual capacity, the most appropriate and responsible thing that a, a prosecutor could do. And as we know, the pre-trial chamber ha has in fact uh, said that uh, given the green light uh, for the investigation to, to go ahead. And the ambassador just says that uh, he, 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 he's, uh, he's looking forward, I think, to that investigation and hoping that perpetrators will be held accountable for violations of international law. And as we know, in this difficult and tragic situation, all sides have been guilty of war crimes. Uh, the court will not end the commission of war crimes, but what it urges states and other entities to do is to hold to account uh, those responsible, both uh, on the opposite side of a conflict and most importantly, on, on their own side. So you may have a comment on that. You probably won't want to, 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 to discuss the specifics, but that's one very important and welcome comment. And thank you, Ambassador, for that. I'd also, speaking of ambassadors, two of my colleagues and two of my good friends are, are in the audience today. Ambassador Mary Whelan, who you know well, who was uh, ambassador to the Netherlands and, and to the ICC and uh, played a very important role in 2010, 2011 as coordinator of the ICC Assembly of States Parties and Cooperation. Indeed. And Ambassador Whelan organized a very successful uh, seminar uh, in uh, the uh, review conference at Kampala on cooperation. And she again thanks you for um, your talk and has a question specifically as to how the court might improve uh, the deterrent effect uh, it's having on, on perpetrators. Okay. And then somebody you also met in Kampala, Ambassador Kevin Kelly, uh, former ambassador to Uganda, now in the Netherlands himself, uh, who uh, reflects on, on, on a comment that you made in your speech about the work of the independent expert review a panel and asks, you know, what can be gleaned uh, from that report that's of particular use to OTP, what you'll be able to do in your remaining time here, and what tasks you'll be handing over to, to Mr. Khan. Then finally, uh, because say time is very tight, we have a question from, um, and I can't find her name right now, but from a, a new resident of Ireland, uh, a, a woman whose family 
uh, became refugees uh, because of the, the, the atrocities being committed in Syria. And she asks, what can the ICC do for the victims of such atrocities? Other people have asked questions in relation to Syria, Yazidi, so many different questions. But she asked in particular, what can the court do? What can you do for the victims in Syria? I suppose bearing in mind that technically the ICC has no jurisdiction um, over the territory of Syria because of the failure of the Security Council to refer the situation. Um, but there may be nonetheless circumstances in which jurisdiction can be exercised. So those are the questions to you. And we may have to indeed wrap up after that because I see we're at five minutes to two o'clock. So uh, I'll hand back to you now, uh, Mrs. Bensuda, and just take back the floor to finally say farewell to you again. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, again for, for those uh, questions. Indeed, very all very uh, important and uh, um, needing uh, clarification and uh, perhaps I should uh, I should just uh, say I should start maybe by saying that um, uh, with the last question on on Syria I will start from there because I I know you have already dealt with it but just to again um, clarify that the ICC does not have jurisdiction over um, unfortunately over what is happening in in Syria because Syria is not a state party. And the other, only other way that uh, ICC could, could possibly have had jurisdiction is like what happened with Libya or what happened with the uh, um, Darfur Sudan, a referral from the UN Security Council uh, asking the ICC to intervene. Uh, absent that, and, and of course, ICC does not, uh, never goes to the UN Security Council and say, you need to refer this. Uh, they act on the powers uh, that are vested in them under the UN Charter. So I, uh, I, I just wanted to um, uh, say that uh, uh, this, is, this is the major obstacle that we face as, uh, as a court. Um, also, uh, maybe I should, I should just say that um, um, we have a lot of communications that we have received in Syria. Um, and very similar to this, uh, and uh, uh, really uh, some that we also attach some great importance to. So what we are doing is that we are finalizing a response to all the senders of communication with, with, with respect to Syria, to explain clearly and carefully what, uh, what, what this is, and, but also with respect to other communications that uh, warrants further analysis. Uh, which will be, uh, I think this we will issue it before the end of my term. And it will cover, uh, perhaps I should, I should just say that, not to preempt uh, questions on that, but to say that we will cover uh, Mexico. Mexico, there will be a, a response to senders of communications. We'll, we'll also talk about Cyprus, the settlements that have arisen. We will talk about Yemen with respect to the arm exporters. I, I, I think these are potential questions, uh, Mr. Kinston, that could arise. So I, I just want to put it out there that we are preparing uh, answers for that. We also uh, do have an issue we're dealing with currently is uh, with respect to Cambodia, the land grabbing issue. We're, we're dealing with that, we'll provide responses to that. And then we'll also, there is a, it's another particular uh, question which I know we've received a lot of communication on, and it has to do with Syria, uh, Jordan, and the deportation issue. So we're, we're dealing with these, uh, these things currently, and we will certainly be sending out uh, responses to the communications, just, just so that those who have these questions in their minds could, uh, could really, could know, could, can know that the ICC is, uh, is um, thinking and dealing with. I, I also want to, wanted to, um, uh, we'll go to the, the, the question from uh, Ambassador Whelan, um, who I'm, I'm very, very happy that uh, is in the, in the, in the audience. Um, I, he's, she's one uh, uh, very committed uh, um, to the ICC ambassador. We, we worked very, very hard with her and uh, uh, like our current ambassador also, Ambassador Kelly, um, is very much committed to the ICC, to strengthening the ICC and seeing that the court works. So I, 
I uh, I'm not able to see you on the screen, but I knowing that you're there, you're there is very comforting uh, as well. And I, I know that your interest in the in the ICC continues. Um, Ambassador Whelan, we had the um, the IER, the Independent Experts Review, and I have said at the very beginning that the purpose of that exercise is to look for ways in which the court can be strengthened, can be improved. There is no institution that will say that it is perfect and has got everything right. So after, after all these years of operation, I, I, I believe, I've said it from the very beginning of the IER, I believe that it was a time to stop and to look at where we are. What is going well? What is not going well? What needs to be improved? What needs to be changed? What needs to be adjusted? Um, I, I've always said that the, uh, we have to constantly continue to improve. That's, that's, that's what an institution that wants to be eff effective does. So we are currently looking at the uh, recommendations of the IER. As I said in my, in my, um, in my lecture, that we're supposed to uh, have a management response to those uh, uh, um, recommendations that have been made. And we hope to do that by the end of uh, March. We are definitely working on it. And again, this is all uh, for the improvement of the court. So this is, uh, this is what uh, we, are, we are doing. There were several recommendations, several, I think over 200. Um, of course, some of them uh, we find they're very, very good recommendations. Uh, some we need, we think that uh, is probably not going to be so helpful as uh, um, to, 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 to assist the court, but all of this will be definitely put in the report and the reasons why. So I, I, I think I will just, uh, for lack of time, I will just uh, pack it there. But I, I want to assure you that we engaged in this process and I, I believe Ambassador Kelly can also attest to that. We engaged in the process, we provided all the documents that the IER needed, the experts needed, we, we, we made our staff available to them uh, from the prosecutor to the deputy prosecutor, all of us, and we provided them with everything that we felt would assist them in this important uh, assignment they were given. And uh, we will take it further because of course, it's good to do uh, um, uh, an exercise like that, but it is more important to implement uh, the, the recommendations of the exercise. So we are, we are working on that. Um, with respect to Palestine, uh, I, I think I have explained again, and you have mentioned uh, Mr. Kinston about where we are. I mean, I, uh, this, is a, this, is a, um, this is a situation that uh, since 2015, um, after a referral from, from Palestine and after uh, uh, an acceptance uh, of the jurisdiction of the ICC uh, under uh, Article 12 of the Rome Statute, I assessed that this is a matter that the ICC can, that my office can open preliminary examinations on. And we did that. Um, it, it is a situation that we all know is very uh, complex, both legally and factually. And uh, we, 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 we gave it a very, very careful uh, uh, consideration, assessment, analysis, collecting all the information that we felt we need. And we increased the team that was working on it. And uh, in 2019, I, I felt together with my team, we assessed that uh, this is a matter that uh, the, all the criteria under the Rome Statute, again, we always working under the Rome Statute, under the laws. It is nothing to do with politics, never has been, never will be. And we decided that le the legal criteria for opening an investigation has been met. However, we said because of the fact that this situation is so fraught with legal and factual controversies, it is something that perhaps as a responsible prosecutor, I needed to go before the judges and to say, this is, what I, this is what my assessment is, but I would want you as judges to help us define the territorial scope of jurisdiction, where we can go and where we cannot go. Um, and the judges have come back after, after a year plus, they have come back, come back uh, saying that 
indeed, uh, uh, Prosecutor Ben Suda, the office has been correct to make this assessment. And these are your, these are, this is the legal um, uh, criteria that you will, you will, you will, you it has been. And I, I also wanted to, to inform that when we collected information, we engaged both parties. And both parties, I, I mean both parties to the conflict, we engaged both with Palestine and with Israel. And we had several meetings in which uh, we listened to either party, we collected information, which we added to our own analysis before finally coming to, uh, so it is not that um, uh, my office has just gone and, and blindly uh, collected information from elsewhere, not from the parties or from one party and not another, we engaged both parties and came to a conclusion. And now that the judges have made this determination, they looked at it, they said, you were right. You know, you, 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 you have, uh, this is your territorial scope and you have a right to, uh, to look into, uh, to investigate into the situation. So as I said in my, uh, um, in my reaction to the decision, I have said that my office is analyzing again, we, we do things very carefully. We're analyzing the, the judgment, what the judges have said, and what does it mean? And then we will take the next steps as necessary. So this is, this is where, where we are with the situation in Palestine. And again, I, I just want to, uh, as the judges have recognized, um, we have not uh, asked, <clears throat> they also have not determined the issue of statehood of Palestine. I think this is outside of my mandate. So I have never, uh, requested for this. We've also not been talking about border, issues of border. That is not my mandate. And I have stayed away from it. And having looked at all the information I have before me, I have also said uh, parties from either side, there are allegations of crime being committed from either side of the conflict. And this is what I had surrendered also to the, to the, um, to the judges. And it is very uh, sad I must say that those who choose to misinform um, uh, continue to say that uh, the office is after one side of the conflict and not the other. These are all misinformation that we need to, 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 to dispel because that is not the situation and people, the record is there and it speaks for itself. People should go back to the record and read it and see the careful work that we have carried out in this situation. Great. Well, thank you again, Mrs. Bensudi. You've been very generous in terms of, of your answer. Just a couple of small points. First of all, apologies on my part. I, I forgot the uh, mislaid the name of our Syrian colleague, uh, Ms. Gafran uh, Kulani. Apologies for that. And I also inadvertently referred to the Palestinian ambassador, uh, uh, Her Excellency, uh, uh, as, as a man, which is a, a very elementary mistake that one should not make. Uh, and my apologies for that, but uh, thank you to her for, for her presence here today. Look, we, we really don't have very much time, so I want to say thanks once more to, to you, Madam Prosecutor, and thanks, of course, to the Institute, to, 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 to Michael, to Jill, to, to Lorcan, to Ross and the others involved in making this event a, a success. But particular thanks to you again, Mrs. Bensuda, and I look forward to your return visit, yes. and hopefully we will have another beautiful evening in Galway we will look onto the sea and we will eat a beautiful dinner and then and, go for a and, back to and have those delicious seafood. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much again and uh, cheers to you. Best of luck. Thank you very much.